here onwards, uh, almost all the studies have followed these target levels. The intensive therapy had 80 to 110 mg per dl, while the conventional therapy had uh, a target of uh, 180 to 200 mg per dl. Uh, so their outcome was that it uh, uh, the intensive therapy decreased the mortality uh, at various time intervals in the intensive group. Uh, that is, uh, uh, in hospital, any cause mortality, 30 and 90 days. Mm. OK. So this was about uh, a predominantly surgical patient. So to follow this up, we had the Lewin medical trial, which was in uh, exclusively medical ICUs. Uh, this was in 2006. They followed the same targets, but they did not find any uh, difference in total death from any cause. Uh, but there was a subgroup analysis which probably came in around 2011 where they did find that for patients who stayed in ICU for more than three days, uh, the intensive treatment group had a lower mortality, again, due to any cause in hospital, in ICU, and 90 days. Also, what they did find is they found a lower incidence of ATI in this uh, group. Uh, glycemic control and ATI is a different topic, but then even there, it is pretty much now uh, not a. It, it, it is not something that requires a study. Now it is uh, uncontrolled sugar levels are considered to be a risk factor for a uh, proven risk factor for ATI. So that is how they seem to improve the mortality. All these trials, their sample size was around 1,000 something. And again, here, the subgroup analysis, the sample size would have been much smaller. Then we had the VISAP study. Uh, I won't talk much about this because this is this is basically a two by two factorial uh, design, which means uh, in this design, what they do is they have they try to study two unrelated risk factors for an outcome. So this particular study, Vicep study, took two things or two factors to be studied. One is the glycemic control, and the other one was colloids uh, as a uh, effect of colloids on the mortality in uh, uh, the ICU. So I think VICEP study, uh, though not related to this, it proved that uh, the higher ATI and there is a, a higher correlation defects with, uh, with uh, colloids. Uh, however, un un unrelated to that, this topic, uh, the even here they had the intensive control and conventional control. There was no difference in the mortality between the two groups uh, for this factor. Uh, rather, intensive control arm was uh, the recruitment in this arm was terminated early due to increased hypoglycemic uh, episodes. Coming to uh, the uh, Vegas designs where these studies are designed uh, yeah. uh, I'll come to that later on so Vicep was a two by two factorial design our next study is the landmark trial nice sugar trial uh, it is a multinational RCT medical and surgical issues a sample size of 6000 plus they had both medical and uh, uh, surgical issues the recruitment or this uh, Randomization for this study is something interesting. It's a bit unique one. This is called randomization using minimization al algorithm. Stratified randomization, we already know, where the uh, samples or the, yeah, the population is divided into blocks. And in the blocks, some particular pattern, uh, ABAB or uh, uh, ABB or something like that is followed. In minimization algorithm, what they do is the first sample is recruited as per the randomization. The second sample is chosen to go either to A or B based on the risk factors. So say, uh, in, and the target is to match the two groups as closely as possible. So you, uh, if on A, you already have an average age of uh, 55. Uh, well, the B has an average age of 75. So 
in the next older patients will all tend to go to group A. So this is how uh, in minimization algorithm the patients are randomized. Uh, the, uh, there'll be a few set of uh, picture criteria which they'll try to target and match. Okay. Uh, so this happened between December 2004 and November 2008. And obviously, we can't blind these studies. Uh, the inclusion is anybody expected to stay for three days in ICU. This becomes very important uh, in the background of the other uh, the outcomes of the other studies. And they should have an arterial line for sample for sampling. Uh, this set of inclusion criteria means the type of patients that were recruited for the study were, what do we say, uh, real ICU patients, like going by the definition for ICU admission criteria, basically patients who are on some kind of an organ support, uh, not just a, a, a post op HTU patient and all that was not considered. So uh, that is a very big positive factor uh, that comes when uh, that is useful when we have to interpret the results of the study. Uh, the ex exclusion criteria are obvious decay, such as expected to be eaten by gay and high risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, high risk of hypoglycemia here they consider acute liver failure and uh, any pathology like insulinoma. So 40,000 patients were screened and 6,104 patients were recruited. And this was the target they had planned at the start of the study for a power of 90% to detect a 3.8% difference in mortality, assuming a baseline mortality of 30%. So this one slide, if you see, when we compare it to the other studies, uh, Nice Sugar is the only study that uh, which could uh, recruit uh, hardcore critical care patients. So the intervention, they had the two groups, intensive control and conventional control. The intensive control, the target was the same 81 to 108. Uh, they gave insulin in saline as a drip. 97.2% uh, of them required insulin. The mean time weighted glucose for this group was 115 mg per gl. Uh, so I'll come to that. Uh, the conventional control, the target was just anything less than 180 uh, to up to 144. 69% required insulin, mean TWG 144 mg per deal. So we see that there's a good separation between the two TWGs. But however, in intensive control, they could not achieve the target uh, glycemic control as an average. So this shows that uh, how difficult it is to achieve a uh, intensive control of glycemic of sugars. So the outcome, uh, mortality at 90 days, not much of difference between the two. Uh, uh, intensive control had 27.5, 24.9 in the conventional. Uh, higher incidence of severe hypoglycemia, 6.8% in the intensive control and 0.5% in conventional control. Uh, so at, at, at 90 days, there was a bit of a difference, but no difference in mortality at 28 days. Uh, I get a length of stay, new onset organ failure, ventilated days, need for RRT or need for transfusion or any positive blood cultures. Uh, so just to review this, as a whole, the nice nice sugar became our uh, landmark cell, which changed the uh, uh, which uh, uh, which defines our clinical practice today that basically the intensive control uh, is not recommended, uh, it's difficult to achieve, and it is associated with higher uh, episodes of hypoglycemia, and the mortality benefit is negligible. Uh, at the most, at 90 days, there's a bit of uh, benefit. So then came the controlling study in 2021. Uh, uh, the uniqueness of the study is uh, they try to target the patient's usual glycemic control. So they got the experience at admission. Uh, based on this, they, they calculated the average uh, 
uh, glucose levels for that patient and they targeted up to plus 15 mg per dl for this um obviously this did not show any implementing mortality and uh, this study is not going to have any impact on our back in the future okay so uh, until now we have covered what do we target for uh, uh, what do we target for uh, the uh, sugar levels so there is we we no more target for uh, intensive control that is less than 110 or 80 to 110 our target is now going to be 140 to 180 mg per dl now how do we achieve this uh, so going for the evidence for this uh, the recommended regimen uh, uh, so till now all the studies that we have seen everyone used iv insulin in critically ill patients there's no doubt about this we will come to uh, this in our protocols uh, yeah uh, the comparison of basal bolus and iv insulin infusion in gigamico did not reveal re reveal any difference in outcomes so it does say that uh, so probably what we learned is uh, it is the glycemic control that mm, matters uh, than the type and even for that uh, we already have enough literature that uh, uh, especially in uh, uh, cardiac issues that uh, uh, uncontrolled sugars are worse and uh, have uh, worse outcomes and uh, baseline is b1c higher it is uh, higher is the mortality all this is already proven so here what we are just trying to see is whether should we go for intensive or conventional control and for that the evidence says conventional control and how do we achieve this does not matter but uh, we'll just come up uh, I'll, we'll just talk about what do we recommend based on these evidences so what is the evidence available for basal bolus regimen uh, this is one of the most common study uh, uh, trial that is recommended uh, it's a, it's a meta analysis by uh, christensen mb uh, so, so they have shown that uh, basal bolus was associated with the uh, lower average uh, glucose levels and the other major um, recommendation is the ada uh, american diabetology association of uh, the their the recommendation in 2020 this also recommends basal bolus in non uh, in non critically ill uh, hospitalized patients so to conclude the evidences uh, intensive glycemic control does not decrease the mortality and is associated with higher hypoglycemic episodes however uh, and uh, sorry hence due to this evidence intensive glycemic control is not recommended iv infusion of regular insulin is to be used in critical care and is recommended in all studies when there is no indication for iv insulin we we recommend basal bolus correction regimen um, so i hope uh, our uh, conclusion is clear uh, now i'll just take you quickly through uh, the uh, through our protocols okay so this is our insulin infusion protocol this is available on radar uh, so uh, there's no need to um, uh, have these things by it it's uh, always there on the radar uh, what is important is let me uh, how to transition between these levels so when you have so when do you so you we usually start off with level two only in patients who are uh, whom we believe to be prone for hypoglycemia like say uh, who's in aki or acute liver failure you try and start with level one otherwise we usually start with level two so when do you continue with the same level when your blood glucose is within the range 
it is above your target, but has decreased by at least 60 mg per dl. So this is what is our target in uh, 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 when on IV insulin infusion. Our target of falling glucose levels should be 50 to 75 mg per dl per hour. So if you have achieved that, you continue with the uh, same algorithm. When do you increase it? So you increase the level, uh, increase the insulin infusion if your blood glucose uh, is above your target range and is not coming down, or has come down, but it's come down by less than 60, or your target of 50 to 75 mg per dl per hour. Then you move up an algorithm. When do you move down an algorithm? So if your blood glucose is less than 110, uh, that is your, your, basically uh, uh, you have come below your target, then you stop it, uh, keep resetting every one hour. Once you cross your one uh, 150, uh, then you uh, start with uh, you start with uh, uh, one level lower. Uh, we reset the blood glucose every uh, one hour up to four values until you are stable. You have stable values for four hours. Then you can return to the second hourly. Uh, yes, Doctor Tilip. Uh, yeah, Sanat just wanted to make a point. Uh, see, the, the protocols are there to standardize the uh, administration of insulin. And one important thing is that this protocol for hyperglycemia is for non-DKA patients. So yes. DKA hyperglycemia is treated a little bit differently. You start off as a fixed dose 0.1 unit per kilogram. Uh, and, and then you do that per hour. You don't change that dose too much because in the initial... Uh, time of decay, the drop in sugar is usually due to hydration and other supportive measures. So just I think we should uh, distinct, um, distinctly mention that this is for non-ketotic, yeah. non-decay hyperglycemia, just routine hyperglycemia uh, in the ICU uh, without any decay. Yes, agreed, Dr. Lip. So the protocol on radar artillery mentions this as not to be used in decay patients. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so if, if possible, let me cover DK protocol as well if time allows. Yeah, because I, I'll let's give the reason also. Because the point in DK is that you want a sustained low dose of insulin in the system to allow for ketosis to resolve. If you rapidly treat the hyperglycemia with higher doses of insulin, you will not have the time for ketosis to resolve. Uh, but in plain hyperglycemia without ketosis, the only problem you need to fix is just correct the hypoglycemia, which you can do quickly. So when do we transit from uh, IV to subcute? Uh, the most important thing is there should be no signs of shock, obviously because the absorption of subcutaneous uh, insulin is dependent upon perfusion. So in shock, your peripheral perfusion is compromised. So uh, you can't do subcute insulin in shock. A capillary refill time would be a good marker for this. Uh, then the patient should be tolerating oral uh, fits and you should have a stable insulin requirement for four hours. So this is something that we will keep on repeating throughout. Uh, then you add the subcutaneous dose based on sizing scale two hours before the stopping of IV insulin infusion. This is very important. We have one of the most common causes of DKA patients getting readmitted to ICU within 48 hours is because of this inappropriate conversion to subcutaneous insulin, either the dose or the timing. Uh, so how do we start it off is you have to start at subcutaneous insulin two hours before. Uh, this is because of the onset of time of the subcutaneous insulin. Insulin it needs some time to get absorbed. And you, we should always choose a basal bolus uh, for this. So how do we decide a basal bolus? Uh, you take your last uh, four hours, which we could is to be stable. Last four hours, uh, RBS values are to be stable. So take this. Uh, so see what is the insulin requirement per hour in this last four hours. Multiply this by 24. You will need you will uh, 
you will get the 24 hour requirement for the patient. Now administer 40 to 60 percent of this dose as a basal bolus subcutaneous dose. Uh, in ICU, there's no need to wait for 10 p.m. to do this. It is just a practice for patients comfort that is followed in OPD basis. Uh, but in ICU, this is not required. Uh, you can do it as and when you decide. Uh, then we have uh, the uh, remaining dose is given as three divided doses uh, of regular insulin. And this should be with your uh, glucose monitoring because again the patient's insulin requirements can keep changing. Uh, also, the reason for taking the last four hours is when the patient presents will have multiple factors which might have increased the insulin requirements. So the last four hours predicts the total 24 hour, the next 24 hour requirements more accurately. Now we will go to the basal bolus so subcutaneous regimen so again we have to start on radar uh, so uh, all this we have already discussed the discussed intravenous insulin infusion is before our subcute boluses this is for dkd dhs we have a different one different protocol i'd like to cover that now if possible uh, then basal insulin dose is always preferred to saline scale alone. Uh, this is something that we have been stressing over and over. Uh, uh, the type of uh, the ease of control is very uh, much higher with basal bolus. Uh, your nurses that your, your nurses that decongested a lot. Then uh, what do we say? Uh, your risk of hypoglycemia, if you are considered about the risk of hypoglycemia, you can even just give 40% of the dose. If you're confident, you can go for 60%. So some people just follow 50%. So whatever is the dose, but just make sure that there is some amount of basal insulin at least possible. I mean, uh, some amount of basal bolus is administered. Uh, also, what is important is not to stick to one dose of one scale of uh sizing scale uh that's the most probably the most common uh mistake that we do uh example everyone uh last uh four hours before my sugar was uh 350 and i give another so i, had, I said even eight units at that time and now this hour is 400 so i can't still use the same scale and do 10 units uh, because that scale is already we know that uh, it's not it's it's not working so we have to go for the higher scale so uh, the, this is something that we have, need to always stress yeah so dr sassi says uh, during transition to intermittent doses it is important to change the basal insulin to a long acting or slow release insulin like lodging and not the immediate acting insulin like after but totally agree with dr sassi uh, yes, yes, Dr. Sunny. Yeah, uh, one important point here is uh, to also look at the trends. And uh, quite often, uh, the sliding scale that we put in is reactionary. But to, it's, it's important once we have stabilized the patient's oral diet, it's important to look at the previous days scales. For example, if the night sugars are high, so when we put the next day's uh, sliding scale, uh, with a fixed bolus dose, it's, it's important to actually bump up the afternoon dose rather than the evening dose. And if uh, uh, the morning sugars are high, then it's important to bump up the night uh, dose. It's, it's always uh, good to keep in mind that you increase the dose which is prior to uh, the rise in sugar and not after. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sanat. Mm -hmm. Somebody... Yes, Dr. Akila. A um, couple of things. Uh, nice presentation. Um, the the thing about the Leuven trial that fooled everybody was the fact that in the details, if you look at the study, almost all the patients were on D10 during the course of their glucose control, yes. <laughs> which 
you know, which we don't do typically. Uh, that's why they didn't have the hypoglycemic episodes um, that you would anticipate would happen. So um, that that is one thing. And most of you are absolutely right. Sixty percent of the patients were cardiac surgery patients. That's part of the reason. If you look at the target dose by a lot of these new studies that are coming out, they're actually recommending between 110 to 140 to 150 uh, for cardiac surgical patients. They're not going down to 80 because they're all obviously afraid of the hypoglycemia, but um, but they but the target is a little bit lower for cardiac surgery patients because of sternal wound infections. Um, that's the big uh, that's the big area for cardiac surgery patients. But general in general post op surgical patients, 140 to 180 is still the dosing uh, that we all talk about. So that that's number one. The other thing is Sano and right of altering the basal and bolus dosing and not using dosing to be able to the corrections in diabetes for everyone. Uh, corrective issue is your sliding scale. Um, corrective issue will not fix the future. It's a reaction to the past. Um, so um, that's the best way to understand it. I, I know in uh, in a lot of post-op ICUs, uh, the RMOs are used to putting the, just a sliding scale and they leave it. And they don't think about basal. They don't think about bolus. Um, they don't make that correction. Um, so we need to uh, work them through that. And remember also one last point, the most common adverse drug reaction worldwide is hypoglycemia related to insulin. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think everyone needs to be crystal clear on this. Um, we get hypoglycemia um, it's on us, um, and especially if the if the blood sugars drop below forty five, you can you can induce brain damage. Um, so be cognizant of that, and um, you know play accordingly. Um, and as far as IV versus basal um, bolus and correction insulin regimens. There has never been really any large data to show that IV drip is any better than the basal uh, basal bolus and corrective uh, approach um, done correctly. Uh, again, you, know, you can you can make arguments in any direction, but the issue here is is that a that is dosed properly will not cause hypoglycemia. Uh, the other thing is, is insulin drips do torture your nurses because every hour they have to do random blood sugar at, at you know, for at least, you know, four hours until the glucose is stabilized. Then every two hours, it's work. Um, whereas the other approach, you're talking Q6 hourly, and it does make a difference because your nurses are, you know, are al already, you know, being tasked with many other things. Be cognizant of that. If you've got a busy ICU, uh, you may want to switch over from IV to um, uh, sub-Q regimen, um, but make sure that you have the, the, the issue. But uh, outstanding talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Tiller. So yeah, uh, this concept of, uh, 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 just a minute, Dr. Sona. Uh, uh, so this concept of D5 correction was probably uh, so that was in 1995 to 2001. So when uh, I am, I'm, I'm not sure what were the calorie uh, targets of those times, but I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if it was the present uh, uh, 25 or less uh, or nine to 25. Uh, so that is why people used to start off with some calorie supplementation at the start, uh, but obviously that is not required now. So we have gone beyond that level where. Now we know that calories is never an issue, it is the proteins. Uh, so that is one thing. Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Swanda. Morning, everyone. Sanat. Good, good morning. <laughs> beautiful, good morning. beautiful presentation. Thank Just you. wanted to add on one thing. It is uh, in our clinical practice, I, I'm, I'm sure you might be covering later, but I, I just wanted to emphasize uh, 
that it's it is quite important to identify its type 1 or type 2 and if it is uh, that this is more for the nurses and if many many times patient is fasting no insulin type 1 it doesn't work like that they need sugar they need insulin it's that's the thing which have to be imbibed in the nurses brain uh, I mean, is that something which you would uh, recommend to Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I should have I should have mentioned this in the protocol somewhere, or yeah. we'll try to include this in the uh, pre-op and post-op uh, protocols. Uh, so uh, definitely, yes, all pre-op patients. Uh, I mean, probably this literature comes in the pre-op period, uh, where we don't put uh, uh, we don't put. Uh, I mean, we are not supposed to keep them just in pure and uh, uh, we have seen a lot of. Uh, patients developing post-op ketosis because of this so yes we should always keep uh in 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 peri-op we don't do this 9 to 25 kilo calories restriction because they are normal people uh so there definitely we should be giving their normal calories or even uh, load them with uh, a fixed amount of calories preoperatively and do the insulin accordingly yeah i think the intra-op uh, dextrose insulin protocols is probably beyond our scope of critical care uh, but yeah definitely yes dr sona uh, i think uh, uh, uh sister jalbaki had raised her hands uh, good morning sir uh, good morning. i just wanted oh, my one query question is sir if patient comes with uh, uh hyper uh, hyperglycemic like above 400 500 and at the same time, the patient's potassium level is also low, like hypokalemia. So uh, even uh, uh, what, what is the solution? So like yes. even we cannot give him, uh, give that patient more. Uh, yes. Exactly. So uh, the answer for this is in our uh, GKA protocol. Let me just quickly finish this and go to that. Uh, okay. Just a minute. OK, so uh, this is more so for the uh, Nurses when to check for glucose for all patients at least six to eight hourly for all critical ill patients for patients who are fasting four hourly insulin infusion hourly can go to second hourly once you have stable values for all patients you should do one on admission at least once a day uh, for those who are being rounding with me will notice uh, we have to you you don't know what's happening there's a lot of medications going on. Uh, and based on the pathology due to the stress, patient might be going into hyperglycemia. Or if you are ATI, ALF, uh, they might be on a lower trend. So any patient at least once a day is mandatory. And at uh, certain dropping GCS. Uh, transitioning, uh, okay, this is subclub to IV insulin. When do you go for some, some subclub to IV when you are... Uh, IBS is more than 350. This is not a very strict value, but basically when you're not able to control it with subclute. Uh, and when you're not able to uh, compare with subclute, it's obviously because the patient is in shock. Uh, the other things we have already discussed. IV to subclute, also we have discussed this. So I'm, I'm just showing you this protocol. So now I'll come to your, so since I have another 10 minutes, I'll quickly go through the DKA protocol. Uh, so we have a one pager uh, i know it's a little cumbersome because of the cumbersome to read because of the content there's a lot so while you're pulling it up what if we have time we can just do maybe one or two quick case examples uh yeah. to to demonstrate some of the points you're covering this might be hard to read okay. unless you zoom it yeah okay so let me go to the actual part of where uh our nurse has asked. Ah, here is the potassium part the previous yeah. one yeah right there yeah. So uh, we always obtain the potassium levels at the admission. So if potassium is less than 3.5, you do not start IV insulin correction. You first do the hydration, you do the potassium correction. And in these conditions, we do not have an option but to obtain a central line to do the corrections. Uh, so usually such patients will be requiring central line for various other issues as well. So start potassium correction at 20 milli equivalent per hour. Uh, and then check around one to two hourly is what the uh, 
recommendations tell but you uh, we already have an hypotermia protocol based on which you can uh, guess what would be your requirement to come about 3.5 uh, so uh, administer that amount of potassium uh, at 20 milligrams per hour and then you start uh, your insulin infusion uh, of course with simultaneous potassium monitoring if your potassium is more than 5.3 you there's no need of any potassium replacement in between if your potassium is 3.5 to 5.3 milliequivalents per liter then you continue with 10 milliequivalent per hour of potassium chloride uh, the references for this is given uh, it's all multiple uh, articles including our uh, uh, ADA uh, yeah so Albert, your sister, uh, have I uh, cleared your doubt? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, sir. So the numbers to remember are 3.5 and 5.5. Uh, I mean, it says 5.3, but I think 5.5 is an easy number to remember. Uh, so uh, important parts about this is uh, the fluid resuscitation takes priority over everything in DK and uh, soda bicarb not indicated unless pH is less than 6.9 6.9 to 7 7.1 you can do a small bolus of 50 ml just to avoid it from falling further insulin therapy so this is the most important part uh, 0.1 units per kg per hour uh, again here a bolus insulin can be given but this has been associated with higher risk of in uh, hypoglycemia so we we recommend just a uh, infusion of 0.1 unit per kg per hour uh, it has been there's uh, 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 studies don't show any inferiority in this uh, which for an adult is basically six units per hour uh, you keep giving this with a target of 50 to 75 mg per dl per hour poll. and once you the most important thing is you don't come down below six units per hour uh, if you're not able to decrease your sugars at this level, you can go up, but you don't come down below this 0.1 units per kg. Uh, so once your RBS is 200 uh, in DK and 250 in HHS, uh, you start off with uh, dextrose with insulin. Uh, when do we stop this? When your anion gap has closed or your bicarbonate is above 18 based on whatever is easier for you to measure uh, another important part is you always monitor for the other ions there's massive fluid shifts here so calcium magnesium phosphorus we should not uh, for that at least once a day uh let's stop that Lea. the other thing you need to keep in mind if they have a history of diabetes um, these patients, especially in the perioperative period, if you're looking at a post-op or a perioperative op patient, um, you got to warn the anesthetist not to extubate the patient because they may not be able to clear their acidemia. Um, normally, surgery causes acidemia. Um, and this is a very important issue that we have to keep in mind as intensivists because if the acidemia doesn't clear and the patient is extubated, that's going to add to their work of breathing. So you really have to kind of play ball with the anesthetists and just kind of warn them, hey, listen, if the patient has a diabetic history, you have to be careful here because that, you know, and we're going to have to work their insulin levels and so forth and so that we can clear the acidemia. That acidemia is almost like a pre-DKA type of situation that you're seeing. It's not... It's not DKA, but it's like a, it comes close to that type of situation. So you need that prolonged insulin drip to be able to control that ketosis and all that. So it's important that you keep that in mind. Yes, I agree, Dr. Attila. So yes, Dr. Sasi also mentions bicarbonate in patients with arrhythmia. Yes, that's something that we need to consider. Um, the transition to subcute everything is the same that we have already discussed. Okay, uh, that's all from my side. Uh, any other doubts or comments?
A wonderful talk. Uh, just that point about beta hydroxybutyrate. It it is a newer marker. Uh, some uh, organizations do say that if your beta hydroxybutyrate is low and undetectable, you can stop the insulin infusion. So that is a fair target for stopping the drip. Uh, yeah, I Meenakshi mean, Hospital has a question or a comment. Please Very unmute and ask. Yeah, yeah, unmute. Very good presentation, Dr. Sanath. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is. Um, the regular monitoring of blood sugar is very difficult in remote hospitals. You know, we have very little nurses. Um, so the subcut uh, regime seems very attractive. Uh, in COVID, uh, peak of COVID, we had to give a lot of dexamethasone and the sugars were 400, 500. So we, you know, uh, we just went on the subcut. And only when the sugar went more than 500, we had to start the insulin infusion because of uh, you know lack of infusion pump and so all those things so the subcut uh, regime was very useful at that time you know i had to go upon high doses of subcut my question to sanath is the, you know the basal insulin um there are different insulin available now uh, like glargine and uh, you know uh, degludec what do you recommend you know um uh, or just a mixed start is enough or what, what is a basal you would recommend uh, no, no. Uh, yeah. it's any yeah. long acting it's any yeah. long acting uh any long, yeah. is the recommended one deglutech is now getting promoted because it, uh, they're saying it is longer than uh, 24 hours 36 hours and there are molecules that are coming up for 48 hours and even for one week uh so these are the new molecules these are not studied in uh I see it, but Deglutec we, we are using in some hospitals, uh, uh, and yeah, it, it seems to be good. Yeah, uh, there is one, one important thing that we should remember: there is no upper limit for these drugs. Probably during COVID, that is what we got scared. So the moment we used 30 units of Lantus, we used to probably get scared and stop hiking it up. So here you have, of course, the, the fear is understandable that uh, uh, you don't know suddenly the patients. Uh, control might improve and your uh, Lantus requirements might come down. So you might all of a sudden end up in hyperlysemia. And we do know that glazing induced uh, hyperlysemia is a little difficult to manage. You need uh, around 24 hours of dextrose uh, uh, infusion for this. Uh, so, in that case, <clears throat> uh, there is something I would like to speak to a few endocrinologists. Uh, uh, so, what they do recommend is uh, there is no because there's no upper limit, you can go up. Like people have were told that they've used up to 90 to 100 units uh, per day. That is what I have heard. Uh, but so you, if you want to induce a safety checkpoint here, uh, it could be to make it uh, 12 hourly. I know this is not uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, evidence based, or this is not uh, what do we say? Neither does it match its uh, pharmacokinetics. But it just gives you that added uh, uh, advantage of, I mean, if 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 sugar uh, uh, if if the, if the sugar control starts improving either due to an ATI or due to some other reason, you still have that the next 12 hour gap for giving the full dose. Uh, yes, uh, 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 Doctor, uh, am I am I clear? Your hands are still raised. Some uh, minutes, yeah, yeah, That's great. Yeah, thank you. So. <laughs> Uh, we can use uh, Gargine uh, and um, uh, or we can use NPH. Doesn't matter. Is that no. what you're saying? No, NPH, no. NPH is intermediate acting doctor. Yeah. So only Glutec and Glargine are the present available in India. Yeah. So just a comment on that, uh, doctor. So we, we do have meta analysis which actually did a head to head comparison on NPH versus uh, Glargine. And uh, the incidence of hypoglycemia was much lesser in Lantus. And uh, this is because it is released very, very slowly for a large, long period of time. Uh, so the chances of you having hypoglycemia with Lantus is much less. However, uh, serious hypoglycemia with Lantus is, it is being documented. However, it, it's rare though. And it invariably happens when you inject it into a, a vein or something like that. Subcutaneous, if you have administered it correctly, when it does lead to hypoglycemia, it can be difficult to control. But uh, in a patient who is otherwise okay, 
uh, and not does not have any major reasons to have uh, hypoglycemia. It's unlikely that glargine alone can cause uh, any life-threatening hypoglycemia. And also compared to you know deglutec and other drugs, uh, we have more experience with lantus. The dosing regimens are more familiar, and it's also more easily available uh, in India. So I, I regularly use lantus as opposed to NPH the IQ uh, population. But yeah, in OPA subset, it, it's uh, it, it's also uh, dependent on the cost factor where you need uh, you know, lifelong therapy. There, if there we just use whatever works best for the patient. Uh, just just one more point to that, Doctor. See, you asked about high doses, right? See, when when you have steroid induced hyperglycemia, uh, we do not recommend uh, increasing the bolus doses. You should just increase the uh, lantus dose. You can use detimir, you, which is levimir. You can use lantus, which is glargine. You can use decludec. And the other point you were asking about the size of the doses. Typically, if you go over 100 units, you may want to split up the dose into two different sites. Because once you give the subcutaneous uh, bolus, the, the surface area of the bolus in the subcutaneous tissue, the absorption is directly proportional to the surface area of the injected amount. So. Once you cross the threshold of about 60 to 80 units, the surface area of that bolus sitting in the subcutaneous fat, the absorption is a little erratic. So what uh, pharmacologists will recommend is to separate it out into two boluses, uh, 50 units in, in one fat pocket and another 50 units in another fat pocket to have equal uh, absorption uh, from that uh, subcutaneous bolus. And you can al always do it uh, twice a day as well. The, the curves will overlap. And typically, we do this when you go over, say, 80 to 100 units. The other thing you can do is that there is a higher concentration uh, version of uh, Lantus available. There is the U100 version, and then there's a U500 version. You can use the U500 version on these patients who are on high-dose steroids so that you can actually give uh, the large dose uh, of the subcutaneous insulin. Uh, Detimer is also a great option, and uh, so is Degludec. But one of the things, and, and, and actually this applies to tube feeding as well, transitioning uh, an IV insulin to subcutaneous insulin when on steroids and when on tube feeding has to be mapped to the basal regimen, not the bolus regimen. So if you're going to use mixtard and you increase the mixtard dose, you're actually increasing the bolus part of mixtard also, resulting in a higher risk of hypoglycemia. So patients on steroids and tube feeds, the basal bolus should be weighted towards the basal part because steroids and tube feeds actually increase the basal level of glucose and not the uh, meal-related swings, because it's continuous tube feeds. So that is the uh, comparison that we can apply when, when doing this. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, enlightenment. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's very useful for my, sc my scenarios. Thank you very much. Yeah, just to add another point, uh, 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 the 6 a.m. glucose is very important for adjusting the lantern's dose. So EDA recommends that we adjust our uh, lanterns based on your 6 a.m. glucose levels. Uh, yes, Dr. Attila. Uh, one, one last thing. I, I think we haven't mentioned it, but in patients who are on oral hypoglycemics, the oral hypoglycemics need to be stopped. Very important because a lot of these patients, especially metformin, even if they're not getting IV contrast and stuff, the problem is dehydrated status can result in our ICU patients and that will give a lactic acidemia that will overwhelm the patient if we're not careful. So again, stop the oral drugs. Very important. Um, I, I know we see we see a, we encounter a lot of diabetics. The last thing I want to mention is is when they are going out of the ICU, make sure somebody is following up, please. Um, you know, these patients, unfortunately, if there is no follow up, unfortunately, they're sent out of the ICU on sliding scale alone. And then what happens is, is that, you know, uh, there is no follow up. There is no other other thing that's going on. So we have to make sure that somebody recognizes that. Um, and these patients need follow up. They need education. And the last and final thing I want to say is I know we're discussing all these options and stuff. Your nursing staff has to be crystal clear on the protocol. You know, this is not about just the doctors understanding the protocol. The nurses have to be crystal clear because they're the ones carrying it out. 
and and they have to understand what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it we put out the protocols but if their understanding is not crystal clear you're not going to get execution where the rubber meets the road so please make sure that you know you go over it with your if you're at bedside make sure you go over it with your nursing staff if we're at the care center make sure our people are all crystal clear on what we want to be doing thank you dr Tiller. uh yeah dr Dripal, uh, uh, i mean we have already done this for the nursing people uh with case examples uh, i think only canada was done uh, i'll i'll get the other two done very yeah easily. we'll be happy to participate we can give examples like if nighttime sugar is 300 and the next day morning is 250 what will you change and by how much uh, if the daytime sugar in afternoon is 250 and the patient is having lunch, how much will you give? If they're not having lunch, how much will you give? I think let's just maybe do uh, maybe a 40 minute session on that. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, yes, Dr. Sasi, uh, as we already spoke, all the three uh, other electrolytes, calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, we have to uh, monitor. Uh, yes, good morning, Dr. Rasmi. Uh, hope you're doing well. What will be the protocol in case of? Non-diabetic, uh, it, it could not uh, change in any ways, uh, Dr. Rashmi. Uh, uh, I'm like Dr. Gleeb, Dr. Sanu, Dr. Dilla. Sorry, what was the question? What will be the protocol in case of non-diabetic? Huh, non-diabetic hyperglycemia, we mentioned <clears throat> that it will be a, uh, in the UK, they call it a variable rate insulin infusion. In the US, they call it IV sliding scale. Um, so we would use a version of that for non-diabetics. In non-diabetics, that fixed rate of 0.1 unit per kilogram per hour is is not the one that you would use. You you can you can keep it uh, you know titrating. That that's the key difference. And the other difference would be um, the fluid administration, the electrolyte shifts, uh, bicarbonate. Those things are usually not relevant in the non-diabetic hyperglycemia. Non-diabetic hyperglycemia is essentially a insulin problem. Whereas diabetic hypoglycemia is a vastly different metabolic fluid electrolyte problem. Uh, so I think that differentiation we can do and the protocol covers it. Yes. Uh, so just uh, uh, another common error that we find is uh, if the attenders tell us that patient is not diabetic, we, we assume it to be so. But that's not the right way. We should always uh, go for uh, the HDMC and then decide is it really uh, now stressing you hyperglycemia or is it uh, a new onset diabetic uh, mellitus? Yes, Dr. Attila. Uh, one last thing. When the nurses are preparing the insulin drip, um, they need a protocol saying that they should empty out at least 30 ml uh, from their uh, drip because the, the tubing will absorb uh, the, the insulin. So um, you have to be cognizant of how they prime it. You have to be cognizant of there are no filters within the, the the line. So these are little things that we have to pay attention to because, you know, if we don't make the process clear, you know, you're going to be thinking, I put the patient on insulin drip, it's not working. Or you and you and you raise it to ungodly levels because it, you think it's not working, but it may be as simple as the tubing was not primed. Um, so we need to make sure that these little steps uh, are all done um, at the nursing level, um, not not just at the physician level. So um, clarity on order sets, and we're we're going to have some uh, pre-prepared order sets uh, available shortly. But as we start putting these order sets into play, um, I know Radar recommends uh, protocol, but uh, better to have a pre preset order set that will allow us to say, okay, just plug in these orders, um, and it'll make life a lot easier for for people who are who are managing this. We try to cover all this in the nursing class, uh, including what Dr. Sona is telling about the syringes and uh, the the causes of failure for uh, control of sugars. Yes. Okay. So anything else? Thanks, Sona. Okay. Thank you all. Bye.